Today's session is about the new media, multimedia consumer. So please welcome our panelists, Susan Albershart, Brandy Price, and Chase Rasbodowski. Susan is the course director of entertainment media distribution in the entertainment business program. She has more than 30 years of experience in writing, producing, directing, and managing projects in film, television, advertising, theme parks, and live production. She also works as a business advisor to small and medium-sized businesses um, who want to take their company to the next level. Brandy teaches the music distribution course at Full Sail. She also consults with indie labels and music production companies on internet business strategies. And she's formerly worked with Atlantic Records and Diatonic Productions. Chase is the course director of business technology and e-commerce at Full Sail. He's consulted as a web developer for over 15 years and has Fortune 500 experience in marketing, operations analysis, and supply chain management. So, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. So be before we start some of the questions and, and get the discussion going, I want to give an idea to our panel about our audience here today. Can you raise your hand if you are someone that creates their own media, whether it's film, music, television shows, got a good amount of content creators in here. Okay, from the consumption of media side, how many of you have paid cable? That's a good amount. How many people subscribe to premium content services like Netflix, HBO, Showtime, kind of stuff? How many people have both cable and premium content? It's a lot. How many people buy media from iTunes, Amazon, Walmart? Awesome. Very cool. So that'll give you guys a good... Okay, how many of you steal your media? <laughs> Susan. <laughs> It's the elephant so, in the room, what is. can I say? Awesome. <laughs> so, so today's, shame on you. Shame. <laughs> today's session is about digital distribution and the consumption of media. And th those are pretty big topics. So I think I want to start way up at the top and um, ask a, kind of the question that some people have differing opinions on. So it's content versus design or technology. So we'll go down the, down the line and... What's king, content or design or technology, Susan? Well, you know, I always say that content is king, but the user is queen. So that means that really it's in the user's control over how you're going to use your content. Um, and that's a lot of power that users never had before everything went digital. So, Content? Just a little bit of your user? Well, I, uh, I actually believe that design is king because um, when, when we go to a website or we go somewhere to buy something or to even just look at something, we are in, we're in the instant gratification age. And design is really so, so important. I mean, how many clicks does it take before you're going to click off the website and just get tired of it? Um, it you can't, you know, buy something immediately, like download something immediately. So I think that design is king. Um, I've, I've read a few uh, studies that some universities have done on that, and, and they typically say that design is the winner. So I, that's my perspective, design. But you probably have to have some good content to go You do. With that you definitely, yeah. And, you know, the big thing in the music industry, I'm in the music industry, is it's the music stupid. So music really, stupid. It, it comes down yeah. to it has to have good con content. So, yeah. But when it comes to buying and distributing online, I think that, uh, design is is king. So, as a, as a web developer and IT guy, what do you say? You know, I've I've changed my answer a couple of times uh -huh. he hearing these, <clears throat> but it, there really is a balance. You have to have content. Content is king. But where I come from on this is it's more short term versus long term. When you're talking about short term, content is absolutely king. That's what's going to get somebody to your website, onto your TV channel. But in the long run, somebody has to be making a value proposition with technology. In a market based economy, somebody has to be making money off the release of technology, whether it's cable or tablets. So in the long run, I would say technology. In the short run, I would say content. Awesome. Well, a big part of this particular panel today is talking about business models and distribution of media and content. So what are, if whoever wants to answer this one, what are some of the newer business models that's happening here in distribution, at least digitally? Well, Film, television? The newest ones are pay what you want and freemium, you know, giving away something for free in hopes that somebody will come back and buy more of what you have. 
uh, and then Pay What You Want is something that Radio had introduced a few years ago. Uh, I don't think it's that popular and successful, though. Um, so, but those are two of the newest business models. And is that true for film and television as well? Is that do you see that happening? No. Um, well, with film, you can make a short and give that away in hopes that somebody uh, finds you, and then they might come back and pay to watch your movie, which I saw with uh, the short Spider. I don't know if anybody saw that. It's a wonderful short film. It's it's very shocking. But the uh, filmmakers really wanted people to buy their movie, and so they put that out virally, and it did go viral. So... Um, Television, uh, a lot of new business models. The web series is new. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say new, um, in the last you know two three years, it's gotten very popular, and um, the, a lot of those are backed by sponsors and you know different advertisers that are having their products placed in the web series, <laughs> and they're actually paying for the production. And I think we're seeing a lot too. On the, is that mm -hmm. considered freemium? That's a freemium, yes. Awesome. Yes. How about in the music and or Chase, you had? Well, you had well I just want to interject something quickly. This is a great topic because we're seeing so many changes on the consumer side of how people access content, iTunes, streaming. And one thing that you mentioned with, with talking about film is I'm always impressed from a technology side how theaters continually reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. From the early 20th century on, they continually reinvent themselves. New technologies from putting air conditioning in the building and saying, all right, you, you want to come see a movie, but you're really here for the air conditioning, to the intellect of saying, well, air conditioning's there, marked up snacks are there, you have everything you want, you're comfortable, so let's introduce 3D and let's introduce better surround sound. And let's, yeah. So I'm really impressed with what theaters are doing to stay relevant, kind of on the flip side of the consumer control that we're talking about. So the businesses are responding to the consumers. I, yeah, I think so with, with theater, and, and Susan, you'd probably be better to, to talk in that level, but from, an, from outside the mm -hmm. film perspective, I'm, I'm impressed with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I know that they're not doing a stellar job, but mm -hmm. they are staying alive, or at least some of those companies are. Go ahead. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, you, you mentioned 3D, and um, uh, that was a lot of the push from that came from China, believe it or not, mm -hmm. because... Uh, uh, China wanted our movies only in 3D. And that's, if we are going to export our movies to China, they have to be 3D. So Avatar, when it came out, a lot of the theater owners wanted Avatar in their th theater and they had to convert their theater from uh, film to digital in order to do that. And that kind of started the wave of people making 3D, especially when they realized that, oh, wait a minute, we don't have to sell a ticket for $10 anymore. We can sell it for $12 or $14 if it's 3D. And suddenly the revenue went up because of that. And you saw a spike in uh, theatrical uh, revenue because of 3D. Uh, and that started the uh, conversion of film theaters to digital theaters, and now if you do not distribute your film digitally, uh, the theaters won't show it because they don't have film projectors anymore. Um, and very quietly last year, Airy and Panavision stopped making film uh, cameras, and most uh, films now are shot digitally. They aren't shot with film anymore. Interesting. So what's happening in music? Uh, in the music music business, yeah, freemium again, you know, you have to prove yourself in order to get people to uh, subscribe and pay those premium, you know, amounts of money. Also, um, it really comes down to the sales funnel and, and the business models now, the sales funnel online, on the internet. Um, you start with, your biggest asset really is the um, email list. It's our biggest currency, it's the foundation of your business model. Um, for, for digital distribution, for digital media. Um, you, you start with the, that one asset, and from there you have to build your distribution channels. You know, your website, number one, absolutely number one is the website. And um, your social media, you have to build up the social media. But in music, I always say stick with, stick with the main stuff. Stick with, you know, uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And use the stair-step method, which is the stair-step method is you start with one social media platform, like Facebook or YouTube, 
you build it, you build your audience till you have a good foundation from, and, and you're building that email list really is what it's all about. Once you have that really good foundation, say a thousand fans, um, then you move to the next social media platform and you move that audience to the other platform. So you're using like a, a stair step method and you keep that email list going, but don't overwhelm your, your, your fans, your consumers. Don't overwhelm them. Just send, you know, if something's going on, send an email. You know, you're on TV or you have a big gig, right? Um, so it's all about the email list. Is that's that's my big thing. I think that is the foundation for the business model today. That's interesting. I, um, do you think that's a trend that people are not following as far as the stair step method when it comes to social media? I know Susan has a, a, a slightly different opinion on on <laughs> on that, which we see every once in a while. Um, Susan, what's your what's your? What's I think your, it, your base is your website because that's where you're going to make money. Um, and I would put everything on your website. That's you have control of your website. You have control of collecting your fans' data. Um, you don't have that control with uh, Twitter and Facebook and some of the other technologies out there. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't use them, and I, and I like the stair-step method, but I think your base should always be your website mm -hmm. that you control. Right. Because look at uh, MySpace, okay? What if everything you knew about your fans... You're coming back. I know, but what if everything <laughs> you knew about your fans was on MySpace, mm -hmm. their email and everything, and they went out of business. Ah! Yeah, well, guess what? Actually, um, I got on MySpace yesterday, and um, I have zero connections now. They erased well, them. They well, erased them. Let me, let me interject oh, from, the, from the technology side here. <laughs> uh, website, by the way, I want to underscore this. I know all three of us have said this now. Website is the most important hub. Social media right. is very important. I can't underscore that enough. But with using your own website, that's where you aggregate all of your social media content to go out. This is where you just put extras so that people who are really trying to connect with you can, or your band or, your, or your, what, whatever you do, they can connect with you. And so when we talk about websites, MySpace is even doing this now since, since that was brought up. Notice you have the option to log into MySpace. Uh, you know, it's not the same company that News Corp bought and then sold. It's a completely different thing now. So it's not really what it used to be. But notice that they allow you to log in with Facebook and log in with Twitter now. That's very important, and you should do this on your websites no matter what part of the entertainment industry you're in because that is how you can capture and collect the user information from Facebook and Twitter once you use that one-click login, you get all the information about that user that they've made publicly available. Mm -hmm. So if you let somebody log into your website using a one-click option from Facebook, you get their age, you get their location, you get their friends, you get their likes, you get their religious uh, orientation, you get their, their, uh, their political affiliations, and then you can use all of these within your, your CRM or your marketing mm -hmm. and really cherry pick who's going to be the best customer for your next, your next big thing. That's a really good point. Uh, going back to something you said about what theaters are doing now to kind of meet the users where they want, you've even seen theaters have one night only events where they're streaming something live from somewhere. Telev television shows, even. Television shows, Q&As with, with, um, with different actors or producers. And you see live theater now being shown in the movie theater. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something that's going to continue, or do you think that's, that's something that consumers want? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Diversification is always good. When we're talking about business models, it's all about the revenue. Right. Uh, the revenue is what allows you to see, see whether you're growing or not, what the, the, what the consumer response is. And so what, why not? If you can have, and, and everything from, from uh, you know, they were airing, uh, I think theaters around here were doing Star Trek because they released it in Blu -ray, or on Blu-ray. Right. And so they had these one-night screenings of several episodes and churches are renting theaters in the morning. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do, if you're, if you're a business that you know you make the majority of your money in the evening and at night, you still have this, this overhead expense that you have to cover. So anything right. they can do is great. And concerts, too, now. They yeah. have concerts at the movie theater, and you can go watch. Have any of you gone to the yeah. one-night event only things at the movie theater? Yeah. And that's great, great for, for if you're a comedian, if you're a band, if right. you're a performer in any way. That's great because then you can sell out to a crowd of you know, a couple hundred right. rather than trying to fill uh, a, a club that has several thousand capacity that if you're just not at that level yet, it gives you a safer option. Well, what's the trend in the distribution of live streaming? Is that is are we seeing more of that? Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. what's the what's the cost 
Ustream, on Google Hangouts. I mean, there, it's all over the place. And I, I think it's a, a great way to get people engaged initially. If you have, if you're kind of a startup, you have a new band or something, um, to really promote that free thing, you know, mm -hmm. that free live streaming, you know, uh, Google Hangout uh, where your whole band is playing live, or even the, the whole band can be in different locations and all just get on Google Hangouts together as a conference and even record together in front of people. There's so much you can do now with live streaming and, and live shows. Aren't we yeah. being streamed live right now? We are being streamed. Yeah, yeah. hi everybody. Hello to the internet. Out there on the internet. <laughs> uh, let's talking about um, the consumption of media. In your opinions, what are the most fascinating trends that are happening now with the way people are consuming media? You want to start, Chase? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> the, <laughs> thank you. The the way people are consuming media, uh, we're looking at streaming all across the board here. And I know that the follow-up answers here are going to contain things that I'm not even thinking about. But just initially, I, I, I know everybody hears it all the time. We talk about it all the time. But streaming is is a very big thing because it's enabling us to access content from wherever we want, whenever we want. Uh, without having to maintain physical possession. And the physical possession part is a larger key for this long term of why technology is important in the long term. Mm -hmm. As we get used to not having to have a physical DVD, a physical book, that's, that's a tough thing to let go of for some of us. But, and I have that difficulty as well as I think everybody does, but certain things we're still going to retain and say, I want a physical copy of this book. I want a physical copy of something. So I don't think physical copies are ever literally ever going to go, and this is technology speak here, uh, we're still going to print some type of circular in, you know, in the year 4,000. Right. Uh, there's no need to get rid of physical distribution, but as far as distributing in the market, well. absolutely, as far as distributing in the market, you're not going to expect to purchase something that way. It'll probably be a print on demand where, okay, this is something very important to me. I want, I want a custom edition to where I have a printed book or, or something like that. So, so cloud-based streaming, very important. Well, <laughs> um, you know, I, I talk in, in my class actually about exploitation of music and how that's not really a bad word, exploitation. And you really have to take, um, you have to take that, that product that you have, you have to take that that song or whatever it might be, and you have to find all the different ways that you can make money off of it now. Because really, uh, what it comes down to in my world is you have to give away stuff. You have to, especially at the beginning, you have to give away a song at least, if not a whole album, uh, digitally. And that's pretty easy and not too expensive to do, but then the way you make money is off bundles, you know, vinyl, um, even tape cassettes are back out again. Um, T-shirts, hats. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Stickers, oh, posters. artwork, you know, uh, draw up some of your own artwork for your band, you know, and, and give that away. I'm sure most all of you have heard of Amanda Palmer and her way of doing it with the, the crowdfunding. Pre-sales is really all that is. You're pre-selling, and you're giving different levels to all your different fans from, you know, $1 all the way up to thousands of dollars. And you can get backers. You never know who's going to support you in what way. And really what they're doing is they're, pre-buying from you. You know, they're not necessarily investing in you. They're pre-buying from you. So you have to kind of think about it that way when you put together a crowdfunding type of business model to, uh, to get things paid for. Are there any interesting, in your opinion, the way people are consuming music these days, are there anything, anything that sticks out for you that's maybe interesting or different compared to before? Maybe something like Spotify or something where they're, they're able to go to this cloud-based system, but share. I know that you can see what other people are listening to at that moment, and you can listen with them. Is that a, a big trend? or? Yeah, absolutely. I know Spotify has, has gotten really big. In fact, Trent Reznor now is going to uh, create a new business venture to compete with, um, with Spotify. And I know my, my space is in the plans to compete with Spotify. It's, that's the new big thing, um, streaming music. And you can make money off of streaming music, not a whole lot. And that's why I was talking about exploiting your music, thinking of all the ways and getting really creative, like Trent Reznor always did. He's one of our leaders in the business models for, for music. And um, I, yeah, I think that, that sharing music is really a big thing now, you know, with using my, uh, Facebook and eventually, I think, MySpace to kind of share your experiences. And 
It's really about finding music, though. Mm -hmm. You know, right. finding and, and, and discovering. And collaborating, because not just on the consumer side, if we're collaborating yeah. by sharing music back and forth and, and we're working on the same thing, but, you know, LL Cool J just launched a line of software for the Windows platform that the same piece of software, you can record, you can exchange notes, you can mix, uh, whether you're on a smartphone, a tablet, a, a PC, whatever you're on. And so we're seeing this increased this increased collaboration, not not just on the consumer side of, okay, I, I like this album, let me share it with you. Um, there are several services that do that, uh, streaming services that allow you to share content with friends for a period of time or have listening parties is, is one of the terms that they use. Uh, but but also on the production side, if you're making content, if you're editing a video, if you're, or if you're mixing a song, there's software coming out that en enables you now to, to collaborate in real time. So you don't have to rely on email. You don't have to rely on these things. So both the productive and the, uh, the production and the uh, consumer side are being impacted by this. Yeah, and, uh, and also with, uh, with finding music um, today, YouTube, even finding film and, and everything, you can find it on, really, YouTube is the number one for finding and discovering new media out there. So if you're not on YouTube and you're a content creator, you better, uh, you better get on there, <laughs> get your channel going. But yeah. what's interesting about how people are consuming film and television, Susan? Uh, Anything? Well, like Chase said, everything is going into the cloud. Um, services like Ultraviolet and uh, Keychest are popping up. And uh, when you buy any kind of physical spinning disc now, it, whether it's a DVD or a Blu-ray, you're going to get a, a digital code that you can uh, be able to stream your content from the cloud on any device. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing the, uh, everybody's realizing is that, you know, just because you know, I can stream it to my television, I might want to put it on my iPad or my iPhone, uh, you know, so I can watch it later on an airplane or something. So you want to have access to it, especially with kids. You want to be able to give them the content they need when they need it, especially if they're sitting in the back of a seat of a car or something. So these... Uh, the cloud is really important for movies. And they want to take it with them. So right, exactly. They want to take it with them and have it access wherever they are. That's part of the when I want it, where I want it, how I want it, you know, and the user being queen. And the, and the bottom, line, <laughs> uh, bottom line financially of that is there is a cost associated with the streaming. It takes massive data centers and massive, massive bandwidth. So when we do this as, as companies, we are undertaking a massive... Ex expenditure on, on our financials. And so what, what we're doing is gauging to see what the response is. Because if we can get people to convert over almost fully to a digital methodology, that even repeated streaming with how many times somebody is realistically going to watch something, unless it's a small kid and a children's show over and over and over, realistically, we're still going to get a benefit financially from eliminating this physical distribution model from all the uh, just really from all of the maintenance that has to happen with physical distribution. So we do see a bottom line increase if we can convert to streaming, even though we have to remember right now there, there is a massive cost to doing this, um, but it scales with the size of your business. And that's the great thing about cloud computing is it's scalable. So if you're a small business, it's going to be a relatively small amount. It may be a large part of your your uh, what you don't want to come out of your revenue, but it, it'll scale up as you grow. So that's, that's kind of the pro and con of, of cloud there. Yeah, but do you think that they have, uh, you know, if everybody buys a copy of uh, Harry Potter, they aren't having, um, you know, millions of copies of Harry Potter in the cloud. It's one copy of Harry Potter in ultraviolet that anybody can access once they have the key code for it. Absolutely, and there, there right. you just get your so bandwidth So it saves cost. a lot of room. Right. It also allows them to uh, put a dirty mark I call it a dirty mark. <laughs> on the file, on the MP3 file or the, the digital file that says, I know you bought that, and you can watch it from any device, but somebody else can't. And that is one of the ways they're trying to combat piracy is by putting everything in the cloud. They have much more control. Well, I think there are some actual legal cases uh, Netflix has with people sharing Logins and whatnot in different states because it is illegal. Well, in yeah, that's states. that's a problem. But they do they do make this point to say that you know X number of people in the, in the household can share it, and for that reason they they've even decided to keep open streaming. For instance, if I'm on my mobile phone and watching, and my wife is at home watching, they're they're not going to block either of us because that they are allowing X number of users right. per account. But still, that opens the door to okay, if I share my username and password with somebody, you know 
there's a difficulty there. And then, then you bring up, can you regulate that? Could you use technology and say, well, if you're outside of a geographical radius, but you can't do that because what if we share an account and one of us is away on business? Right. Or that, that, that becomes a problem. Okay. Well, geotagging, he meant, he, that's huge right now, too, in distribution is knowing where your fans, friends, and followers are. And that's why it's important for you to have their data so you can geotag them and know where they are. And uh, another way to combat piracy, if uh, you are in Australia and you try to stream a movie uh, that has not been released theatrically in Australia, they're not going to allow it. The ISP providers will stop it. And that's another way that they're combating piracy. Well, and, and that should be on the service provider. The ISP, at least in the United States, isn't legally required to, to do that. And, and they shouldn't. It, that should be the service provider of whoever owns yeah, that file. Yeah, but Comcast is the largest ISP provider in the United States. And Obvious they own NBC yeah. Universal, yeah. and so it's in their best interest. To oh, I'll, I'll guarantee you they're yeah. watching for it. But, but then oh, again, yeah. if, if, you and I, if you and I started a business right now and we were going to say, okay, we'll buy all the infrastructure, we'll connect to the backbone, uh, the backbone of the Internet, and, and we offer that, we're not legally required to. But if we had a financial interest, I guarantee you we would, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we're talking about combating piracy, and I just think that um, we have to change our business models because it's really, I don't think, kind of, not really, but... There's a, there's a not, cost to free, always. Yeah, there's always, always. a cost. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Facebook's not free. You're, you're selling your privacy. Um, you, yeah. But I think that what it comes down to is, you know, music is a service. So if you give away that, you know, that free product to let everybody know, hey, just like the radio does, right? Mm -hmm. They put your stuff out there. People put your stuff out there for free all the time to promote you, like Napster. That was the big debate back 13 years ago. Well, I think you can go to the John Mayer story with Napster. Is he intentionally put his music on Napster, mm -hmm. tagged it with music like someone else, and we know his story now. Yeah, so. I, exactly. And I think that it's all about getting it out mm -hmm. there. And then from there... How do you make money off of it? And brands are the big way now. You know, partnering with brands, partnering with the sponsors. Mm -hmm. it, you have control now as a content creator of your music, of mm -hmm. whatever you're creating. You do have control over it. But see, I'm coming from the music industry. But I'm not talking right. about from, from web. That's where content is king as well. Because uh, think about this: How <coughs> impressive does your content, or how specific or unique does your content have to be in order to monetize content on the web? Unless it's a pay-per-view event, unless it's some type of niche industry, you're not seeing a lot of subscriptions. So to sort of go back to the original question of business models for, for the web, for, for websites, for mobile applications, we're in freemium mode heavily. I mean, if mm -hmm. I just installed Ubuntu on, on a computer yesterday, and it's here, you know, do you, want to, do you want to donate $16? No, I'm just trying it. Right? So freemium is in place, but what's even more so relevant on the web is advertising. Absolutely. That, Monetize just, on YouTube for yeah. sure. Become a partner because it's free now. Everybody can do it. Right. And that's fine with television and, and music, yeah. but with a film, you really don't want an advertisement no. while you're watching right. a movie. Not at all. Um, you, you know, do see and it is, it is really different. Yeah, it is product, but product placement is such a small part of it. Uh, a lot of times when you see products in film, it's really just to pay for part of the production of right. the film, it's not to pay for anything else. Right such as profit of the filmmakers. And do we have any filmmakers here? How would you like it if you spent uh, about five years making a movie, okay? Every penny you, uh, you had, your parents had, your friends had on this movie, and then you want to make money back, right? But everybody takes it, and you don't make any money. How would you, would you make another movie? No, you wouldn't. In that case, yeah, you wouldn't be able so to. You gotta, you gotta make money on movies. You, yeah. I mean, you have to get people to pay, at least if not for a ticket to, into the theater, uh, at some price point. Um, I know I'm a red box girl. I always tell my students this. That's my price point is a buck. So, you it's know, like a dollar thirty now. Yeah, I right. It's a dollar thirty. That's my price point to watch a movie. You know, plus I have Netflix right. and Hulu and everything. But. Um, uh, but I did spend, I would say, over $100 over Christmas break going to movies. Right. And I saw all of them, and I can't wait for the Academy Awards now. Well, That's I have sweet. an idea. But what if, what if you have your, probably couldn't do this in the theaters, but 
if you're watching television, you know, the second screen, third screen technology. I like that lead in. <laughs> you can you can kind of build a new business model where you're watching it and hey, you really like that sweater or that watch right. that you see that, you know, you see Eminem wearing well, in his music video. Let's ask a question or, real quick. It's in the we'll lead back into that. How many of you, when you're watching television or you're participating in consumption of media, are only doing just that? Just what? focus solely on the TV. Wait, you guys can all multitask. I know that. Just that. <laughs> just, just the TV. That's it. So looking at the content and really fully immersed. Well, one of the trends... Probably that, uh, video gaming, though. Video games, Pro yes, Probably there. That's true. Maybe. There are other things that are happening in the video Yeah, games. casual gaming, no, but yeah. some people have those apps open on their phone, like, okay, where do I have to go for that? I mean, it's intense. Well, what Brandy was leading into is um, the term second screen, third screen, and sometimes even a fourth screen. So maybe you guys can talk a little bit about that in your areas. Um, and... and Brandy, you can continue where you were going with that, with your second okay. screen options or your All third right, screen yeah. options. So first, first screen would be your television, right? So second screen is like your laptop that you have sitting there with you, right, while you're watching TV. And then your third screen is mobile. So it would be your phone sitting there. How many of you text at the same time playing around your laptop while you're watching TV, right? And then... <laughs> and no, so the, no, no, never. <laughs> All the time. I do. Oh, my. Um, so if you could actually take your phone and just put it up in front of you at the TV and, you know, take an app and take a picture of something you like there and actually buy it right then, how could we monetize that? How could the musicians and, that are in the music video or anybody that owns the content, how could they make money off of that? Right. How could they track that? That's what it comes down to. But that's where we're going. And, and content, just, and I don't know if I'm interrupting or if that was a pause, but I don't want to interrupt. Um, <laughs> because you're on a really good, good idea with this. And one of the things is second screen, third screen, fourth screen. It's not necessarily about you being independent. So as content creators, if you are a content creator, think about this. How can you control the second th screen, third screen? Not just is somebody tweeting about you. Why are they in, absolutely, why are they in the Twitter app if you want them tweeting? Do that from within your app. If you want to push a product, you say, well, here's the shirt, the watch, the hat, the, the shoes, the car that we've had in our, our small independent movie or our television show or our web series. Have, an, have a, an app that goes along with that, and HBO Go is doing this, and several others are, are pioneering it, but there's not enough content like that to where I can just right. deeply get into everything. Right. And, and I, Netflix considers HBO Go their biggest competitor right now. Rightfully so. Yeah. If they were to leave cable model, right. uh, that'd be rough right. for Netflix. Um, yeah, and the, when you talk about the, uh, these screens, you have, like you were saying, you have to figure out a way to monetize your content across them. Um, and it could be a way to extend the story, too. So you can focus on maybe another character in your uh, project on maybe a mobile application. Or you could um, uh, maybe create something on your iPad that one of the characters likes. Like maybe they're a cook or something and you want to put, you know, a cookbook that this character talks about or something. You know, I that your mother does that. Well, I do that. Can you no, imagine? I, I, I have all my cookbooks on my iPad. No, not the cookbooks. Can, can you imagine watching Lost, if Lost had done that? They had a lot of inner, immersive right. stuff, but yeah. not on second and third screen. Yeah. That would have been an impressive and a yeah. great great example. Yeah, so um, and, uh, Anthony Zyker, the man that created the CSI franchise, is really big into this and experimenting into these other screens, I mean, he had one of his characters go into Second Life and try to find the bad guy in Second Life. And when you're in Second Life, I anybody here Second Life? Do you have an avatar in Second Life? Oh, I guess okay. these are business students, mostly, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee Second, the game Second guys Life has had, had some difficulty getting it. I mean, the, they have moments of momentum, but I'm not sure they're ever going to hit any critical mass. It's Who, just, Second Life? Yeah. Oh, they have millions of people in there, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, and, and they have a thriving All economy. The uh, there are musicians, yeah. and think about this if you're a musician. Yeah. <laughs> there are musicians that go online, and they have their MIDI hookups and everything, and they play live mm -hmm. through their avatar. You, you never see you as an or individual. Or in their bar that they create. Or they create you a bar. You can buy their music. So a yeah. full thriving economy, but still... 
just like the right. poll of this room went, there are millions of people there, but I mean, there are hundreds of millions of right. people just within the U.S. So That's about building your fan base, though, in Second Life, which extends to the entire world when you're there because everybody from other countries. But, but going back to um, what I was saying about these other screens, um, you have to think about that when you create a brand. Whatever that brand is going to be is how do we extend it to these other screens. Full Sail does a really good job of it. Um, kudos to their platinum marketing team that does this. Even your schedules for this today were made for a mobile application. They weren't made just for our, the uh, website. So you have to think about that and add to your budget in order to do that. Now, another thing that's happening is, does anybody use CS6 in here? Yeah, great. Because, you know, they have the new, uh, you can adapt to those second and third screens now, right? It's much easier, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Um, so just, you know, make sure you uh, use that. And, and HTML5, of course, does that natively. And we've, we've gone back and forth about the, um, the benefits of both personally and previous conversations that we've had. Um, <laughs> HTML5, though, if, if you're looking for a little bit less of a, uh, of a learning curve, you know, maybe more. It depends on your background. If you're technically inclined, it's less of a learning curve. If you're more creative and, and used to being in software applications, then it would be more of a, a learning curve. But with HTML5, you can cross-deploy uh, uh, literally across anything with a browser and wrap it into a mobile app if you want for the, for the big markets like iOS and Android. Well, I'm not a tech person, but um, I, I do build websites a little bit. Um, I, I've used WordPress a lot, and I've got a template for my WordPress site that you just click a little button, and it makes it for mobile. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you're talking second and third screen, uh, the biggest part is figure out how people are already consuming what you're doing and how you can monetize that. Is that, is that the biggest takeaway, you would say? Is that there should be a monetization piece of it? Oh, yeah. It's, it's all your imagination at this point. Um, and as a designer, what can you do to design something for that? And uh, wearable technology is the big thing now. So if you're going to, if people are going to start wearing, you know, wrist watches which you're, with a computer and the w wrist watch that you can look at it. You know, as a designer, how can you design the look of the content in your wrist watch, right? right. And then um, Is that Google the Apple iWatch? Yeah, uh, yeah, Apple's designing uh, yeah, that. A lot of and then ones Google Glass is coming out with the glasses this year. And you have designers that are designing like crazy. What does the content look like when you watch it on your glasses, how do you design that, and and how do you monetize that? I, you know, do you just click something here? I mean, what is it? What is it? And you guys are the generation that needs to be thinking about this in the next five years. Where is this going to be, and how can we make money on this? Yeah, and I then wanna, do it. I want to give you the the next step of that as well, because you really are the generation that's going to be doing that. And what we're talking about now with, with flexible glass from Corning, which Apple is reportedly looking at um, for, for a watch and several other companies, um, there's the Samsung plastic bendable display that's, that we've seen demoed. But one of the biggest things is, I, from a technology point of view, I can't guarantee you that we're still going to be dealing with screens by the time you're finished with your career. Except for, all right, we'll keep TVs around, we'll keep theater around. But Vuzix is coming out with a, a single point NI projector that looks like a Bluetooth headset that just kind of pokes out and then has one point of light that beams into your eye. And we've seen things like this before, but it, coming to market, it should be in mar on the market in 2013, we see that and we see um, really just a whole wide variety of technologies that are making us question, is the screen even going to survive for the next 50 years? And that's a big question mark right now because we think 50 years is so far out there but if you have a long career right. and you want to stay in the industry uh, your entire life, you'll, you'll be dealing with and that. And that yeah. may be where technology supersedes how you create that con or the content itself. Because if a consumer is not willing to consume the media in that screen or whatever technology you come out with, is well, your content holograms, as important? I mean, holograms yeah. are, are even in music business now. You can... I mean, they've been doing this over in Japan for a while. You know, right. they even create cartoons that are hologram. They're just completely made up. Mm -hmm. You know, they create the voice, they create everything, and 
I, I know many of you already know, the holograms are out there, and I think that's where concerts are going, live shows. You can have one concert, and then it can be you know, aired in different areas, which is pretty amazing, and you don't even need a screen for that. So, yeah. Yeah, and a final thing on, on, for me on this part is you have to think about this. We've been able to put an iPod Nano into a watch for a long time. And we, developers, and this is where we go back to the design portion of this, developers have not flocked to design applications for the iPod Nano. Developers have not flocked to design applications to wearable devices that have existed in the past. Virtual reality goggles, these types of things. Now, Google has the ability to change that with their glasses. There are several other things coming out. Microsoft, with their proposed next Xbox, has some augmented reality glasses. Um, and, and of course, the one I, I indicated before with the one point of light projection. But we, we, I mean, we really have to take a step back and look at what's going to happen overall technologically. And I, I think in the long run, we, we, we just, this is a part where I hate saying this because we just don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm not comfortable saying that, but, but there, there we go. Well, and then now you've just gone to content as king because you don't know where the other stuff is going. <laughs> and that's, yeah, absolutely. And all of the, all of the answers are time dependent for me. So technology in the long right. run, content in the short right. run. But, but yeah, no developers flocking to that. And I don't see I don't see if you build a watch that too many people are going to. It's more status, and that's where people are focusing right now. There. Yeah, I, I don't well, see. Well, you could put it in your shoe, you know. Yeah, like, I don't see too many people playing Angry Birds. <laughs> going, you know, well, I don't. Not enough I don't know if it would be that. It'd be more of uh, just a computer, like, okay, what time is my appointment, and what's the address of that restaurant? You know, kind of like we use our mobile phone now. Palm Pilot, 1990s. Well, <laughs> yeah. It's just not on your wrist. The, yes. Right. So um, we talked a lot, uh, well, we talked about the, the, some of the trends and some of the things that are happening for the content creators, because I think a majority of the people in here have created some kind of content. Um, what are some of the essential ingredients in order to like sell your stuff? Like what, what should everyone have or make sure that they're doing or have access to or something along those lines? In yeah, well, number one, you have to have a clear idea of who is going to want to watch it, listen to it. You, you have to know who is your uh, customer. Target and, audience. Yeah, your target audience, your niche, especially when you're starting out, uh, you know, you, you're going to be making things for a niche audience. So you really have to have a clear vision of who that is, um, number one. Um, number two, and I could go on and on and on, but, you know, make it entertaining. If, if you, would somebody really want to listen to it or, or, or make it and make it as great as you can? You know, make sure that the sound quality is good. Make sure that the, the picture is in focus. Make sure that, you know, the production quality of it is as good as you can make it. Um, and know yourself. Be unique. Differentiate yourself any way you can. Um, and then Chase said something earlier. You have to involve your fans in your creative process. How can you involve them so that they can help you collaborate? Because I guarantee you if they feel like they're collaborating with you as you're making this, mm -hmm. they're going to buy it the minute it's done because they're going to want to support quick. you. Excuse and me? Wallets come out quick. Oh, yeah. So how can you involve your fans and your, your creative process? And that's evidence in the latest Kickstarter and crowdfunding mm -hmm. and Indiegogo and those kind of sites, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So uh, with, with music, um, music distribution, uh, you really need your distribution channels in place first, which would be, number one, your direct-to-fan uh, website, and your aggregators need to be, you know, uh, put in place, which you can choose between Ditto Music, CD Baby, Reverb Nation. Um, there's tons of yeah. aggregators. Do you want to explain? Yeah. A well, little... Nimbit is direct to fan, but yeah. they're through Ditto Music. Could you explain a little bit what an aggregator is? Like... Um, an aggregator is a digital distributor. They just have, um, they put your stuff into a catalog and then they get it out to the retailers online. Mm -hmm. So you need your aggregation put in place. You need your website number one with a direct to fan distribution. You need a store. So that store, you can go through Nimbit, you can go through uh, Banzoogle. I really like Banzoogle a lot, too. Um, ba uh, Bandcamp, right? You need that, that direct-to-fan distribution. That's number one. Um, but then you'd want your aggregators in place because some people only like to buy through iTunes. They have their, they have their favorite. And um, then you need your social media platforms put in place with stores, ways that you're monetizing each of them. 
So YouTube, you're going to monetize by going on the back end and going to your actual videos and clicking monetize this video. Mm -hmm. And then um, Facebook, you have to have a store. And your promotional channels. And you know, I always you know, tell my class, CMJ, um, College Music Journal. You know, that's, that's, the, that's to the independents what Billboard is to the masses and the, the big labels. Even the big labels go to CMJ every year in October. CMJ, College Music Journal, is that's where you start your campaign. You know, you get your vinyl, you get your wax, you know, is what we call it, and you bring it to the DJs. You know, you make a whole campaign out of CMJ, and you go after, you go after that because that's the tastemakers in the industry. So you just really need your channels put in place and your promotional, uh, your promotional plan put in place and then work on it every day. Consistency is key. Consistency is absolutely the key. And, you know, one other thing about these aggregators, be careful um, about the aggregator you choose because there's a lot of them popping up on the Internet right now with flashy websites. And just because they say that they can get your product onto all these online stores doesn't mean they're ever going to pay you. So go with a reputable aggregator and really check them out. Uh, for film, you have aggregators like Distriber and Film Baby that, that do the same thing for film. And, and uh, so. Yeah, and Host Baby is for CD Baby if you want to do direct to fan through there. Um, but really, you also, you also need publishing, and we have all these new media publishers out there for music. But you need to make sure you're, you're hooked up with Sound Exchange if you are a musician. Go to soundexchange.com. You need to register so you actually get paid for your music that's being streamed online um, or, you know, put out there online on web and radio and all of that. Pandora. Yeah, Pandora like Rhapsody. Pandora. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, Spotify. there's, you know, it's really just the basics. Publishing, aggregation, uh, your website, and your social media channels. And make sure that, number one, before you do anything, have an email list that you know is not going to go anywhere. It's not some... Fly by night company. You know, I use Aweber, and there's also um, a bunch out there. There's MailChimp and Mad Mimi, and Constant Contact is awesome. Yeah. I love Constant and, Contact and, and any, Eye Contact. Any good. CRM solution, whether you're talking Salesforce, Microsoft, Oracle, any CRM solution, well, Sugar CRM is free. Those are kind of expensive for them. Well, Sugar but CRM is free. I would suggest Act by Sage. That's like $175, and it, you don't have to pay a subscription every year. But that's, and this is also the benefit of cloud computing because when it relates to software, when we're talking about running a business, it's going to help you lower the cost of purchasing and acquiring software because you don't have to anymore. So uh, if you take someone like Salesforce, uh, and, and all the large ones have cloud uh, platforms as well, but we're talking you know, anywhere 10 to $20 a month per user for a small company. It can go up to several hundred per user the more you do. But most companies can afford 10 or 15 bucks a month in order to manage all of their sales and marketing. So cloud computing does help there as well. But keep that in mind. Susan's absolutely right about this. If you're going to go out and just buy CRM software, uh, customer relationship management software, it, it can be very expensive. So uh, look, look towards a cloud option there. Susan, uh, Brandy has probably talked about this a little bit more, but so for the content creators, what in, you know, kind of in a few words or a high level approach, what should someone that's making film or television shows, how, how do they go about promoting this consumption? What's the, I mean, we've talked a lot about it in the music side, but for film, how, what should they be looking to do? You mean to market their movie? Just to get people to watch it or be a part of it. Oh, um, not while well, they're making it. Can I just I tell you about that. a new thing that's happening? And sure. I'm and I'm talking about real world here because we're full sailors, right? So, if this is your first film and you want to get it into a movie theater, and it's really really important to be able to show your movie on a big screen. Okay, yeah, I'm watching it at home on the television is okay too, but when it first comes out, you really want to get it into a theater. There's a new program called TUG, T-U-G-G, and it was just launched a few months ago, and it's in a, they call it a beta version right now, but what you can do with TUG, and there's a lot of movie theaters that are um, part of TUG, you can go like to your favorite AMC that's in your community, and they're part of TUG, and you can say, I want to book your, a, a movie theater in this theater on November 29th. 
and they will book that date for you in a movie theater. And they'll tell you, okay, if you have not sold out the theater or sold certain number of seats by November 27th, you lose the theater. But if you have met that those number of tickets, you will get the theater. It doesn't cost you a dime, and you actually make money off of showing your movie in that theater. So that's the newest way for indies to get their movies shown that, in a movie theater. Is that like theater. an auction where there's a minimum requirement, or do you have to completely sell out? Because no, you, otherwise, no, there would be a lot of disappointed fans. No, I think there's to, a minimum, but okay. you're, then you're responsible for marketing and promoting your screening of that movie. And you can do this all over the United States, which is the beauty of it. So if you want to have a uh, national release of your movie, all you really need is somebody in each market that is your tug representative that's going going to do all of the marketing on your screening of your movie in that theater on that date, which is awesome because then you're using social media to get the word out. You're not using expensive advertising, which all of the big uh, studios use, like, uh, you know, television advertising, which is very, very expensive, and radio advertising, but you're doing it through social media. So you recommend, you recommend the stair-stepping approach after you have your website built, um, as Brandy brought up earlier? Efren Indy? For someone distributing a film. Yeah. yeah, well, once again, you produce for distribution. So before you even shoot one frame of film, mm -hmm. you have to know who's going to buy your movie, right. okay? And then you start producing and distributing at that point. So, um, and once again, to make a movie, sometimes it takes five years from the concept of the idea until it's actually ready to be shown. But you have to... Um, immediately start gathering your fan base of fans, friends, and followers, bring them into the creative process. And then what I like to tell indies is start at a, try to get your film into a tier one film festival, um, such as Sundance, Toronto, uh, Cannes, uh, South by Southwest, Tribeca. Try to get it into one of those. And that's when you start your marketing campaign in earnest. And any marketing dollars you have. And if you are going to make a movie, please make sure you put marketing dollars in your budget. Don't get your movie done and find out you have no money to market it. Do not let that happen. So try to get it done right away. Um, but hopefully at a tier one film festival, you'll have a big distributor discover your movie and pick it up. And then you don't have to market it. They'll do it, well, and, and um, be, which is what happened sure with Blair Witch. Film, the local, be sure to invite the local film reviewer for the newspaper or whoever to, to this if you're screening. But on the, the stair-stepping thing, I do want to interject this because it's very important. I'll kick myself if we, don't, if we, if, if we as a panel don't say this. It's a great philosophy. Use it. It works. However, as you're setting your website up, go to every single social network that you can think of. Ask friends what social networks exist mm -hmm. or social bookmarking or anything. What exists that I don't know about? Make a comprehensive list. From there, start registering your name or any IP that you have, any intellectual property that you have. Start registering it. Get the name. Secure it. Lock it down. I don't care if you just simply connect it so that one aggregates to the other through a social media aggregator, not a music aggregator, social media aggregator like Hootsuite or TweetDeck. But go ahead and secure the names because you don't want to run the risk of somebody kind of catching on to what you're doing and, and, and taking your IP. Yeah, that's a great idea. Absolutely. So I had a question uh, IT-related these ecosystems that are out there, whether it's Amazon, iTunes, can anyone get on there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, content-wise, anybody can get on there. Uh, typically, how this is done, if we talk, let's talk about mobile first, if that's all right. Mobile, you're going to go to whoever the ecosystem owner is, whether that's Apple, Google, or Microsoft primarily. There are secondary and even tertiary app markets. Secondary would be, you know, like Facebook application market and uh, Amazon uh, as well. Um, best bet, make sure you're in the primary markets. It's a relatively, each one is a little bit different, but it'll probably cost you about anywhere from 50 to 100 uh, per year, depending on which ecosystem you're developing for. And remember to, to cross, just like we were, whether you're using CS6 or whether you're using HTML5, or whether you're a programmer and, and starting with C++ so that you can port to every single type of device. If you're programming applications, if that's your field, make sure you can use something that can port easily. Java ports fairly well. We've seen that with, with Angry Birds. But the truth is, 
go ahead and take it a step up a little bit to C++ um, so that you can port across everything. So that's mobile. As far as um, we're seeing ecosystems emerge on, on desktops and those integrating with mobile, right now your big players primarily w would have to be Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, and Google. With, with If you add other things in, you obviously get different answers. Like if you're talking about video games, it's going to be Microsoft and Sony. So just be aware of who is at the top of the industry that you're in and keep in mind where your competitors are going to. Because if you're blip.tv, which was relatively unknown a couple years ago, and they, they existed, and Susan, oh, we've had private conversations before that they're a really great web series aggregator. If you want to get your web series out there, blip.tv. Again, very little known name, and I always had this hesitation of bringing them up that somebody was thinking, I'm just picking on this, this you know, second-rate service, but now they have Xbox applications, and now they have mobile applications, so they can get your web series out everywhere. Be familiar with what your competition's doing, because I guarantee you, if you're working on making a website and a mobile app, they're going to one-up you and try to put their, their thing on uh, the Xbox or the PlayStation, or that they're looking at uh, tablets or, or somewhere else. So just just be aware of where your industry is going, because all of these screens are conveniently merging into one. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we were really merging them into one, but merging them into the same same type of output for each one. Well, I know that Chase has mentioned a couple of these things, but let's try to predict the future with all your expertise on this panel. And um, <laughs> what do you think is going to survive out of what's out there now as far as whether, maybe we can start with you, Chase, with the ecosystems and, and the people that, like, will iTunes continue to be a big player? Or is Walmart going to come in and take over the, the content? Or what's going to happen? Amazon, yeah, I, I really, I really see from a technology point of view. So don't boo me out of the room since we're content and entertainment uh -huh. people. Uh, but don't boo me out of the room. Technology-wise, it's really a three-way race, and it's not between the people you think I'm going to say. It's Google. You're, you're expecting that. You're probably expecting Microsoft, and then you're expecting one I'm not going to say. The third one really is an, a different A company, and that's Amazon. Mm -hmm. When it comes to technology, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon because they own cloud. Uh, they all have their own cloud platforms. Apple. Apple from content. Distribution on iTunes is declining. Market share has declined by over 40% in tablet space. For the first time, iPhone's not meeting sales projections. Technologically, Apple's not going anywhere. They're doing a great job. But they're having what's basically a, a market correction is what we call it in the stock market, and they have had one of those as well. Great company, solid. They're going to be distributing content for a very long time, but they don't have the cloud platforms that these other three have, nor the gaming systems. Nor may have but a iTunes opinion. is is not a distributor. They are a retailer. Right. They're an online retailer. So, um, I think the biggest disruption going forward is going to be in the cable industry um, and how we get content brought into our homes. Um, I think that is going to be a big disruptor. I don't. How many people in here have cable? A lot of them. Yeah, a lot of them. I just cut the cord. Um, I'm thinking of cutting yay. the cord. Yeah, I just cut the cord, and it was very traumatic for me because I've been a cable subscriber for 30 years, um, and I didn't think I could do it. But this man right here convinced me that it could be done because he likes content too. And he so, did if anybody it a from the cable ago. companies are watching right. out there on the internet, don't uh, you come right. hire me? They, they're but, not your friends. But I got to tell you, I did it. I did it, and. Um, uh, I bought a super duper antenna from my attic. I put it in my attic, and I had I had to change all my televisions from analog to digital because I didn't want to buy the box. So I have now I have a smart TV. Love Samsung smart TV. I think Samsung's going to be a huge player in the in the in the future. I think Samsung is really underestimated right they're, now. They're one of two companies in the entire world that is vertically integrated through electronics. And what that means is they design the chip, they manufacture the chip, they put the chip in products, they release the products to market. Right. LG is the only other company. So both are South Korean. Right. Uh, I think where Susan's kind of going to is that the distribution of content may eventually be a lot more a la carte. Right, And you exactly. may be able to just select exactly. things for your cable. Exactly, exactly. So um, it, was, it was difficult, be, but I did it. And <laughs> I cut my bill from $135 a month 
down to about 56, which is uh, real exciting for me. And she's not, lo- the, the best part about it is with, with things like Hulu Plus and yeah. Netflix and Amazon which is Prime. Extra. They are extra, but you're still able to access most of the content that you were watching to mm-hmm. begin with. I know Brandy's um, so, trying to get in on this, but I'm yes. going to interject. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just remember, though, we're not to the point for everybody because you still can't get HBO and ESPN Correct. and and several others. Um, but you can buy them a year later. Right. So you, they're right. available a year later. You right. just got to wait a year, and you know. So, but but that is that definitely is the future. That is where we're going. Um, there, there are people who are, will argue it, but there were people who argued the airplane and the automobile as well. Sorry, sorry, Brandy, go ahead. No, 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 you're good. No, I was just going to say last night, actually, I was listening to Slacker radio on through my Blu-ray player on my TV. That's how I listen to music a lot of times at, at home, right. is right there through my, my television from my Blu-ray Not through player. your Walkman? I watch YouTube, I, I, everything I on my I TV through Blu-ray. I, I just think that's, that's awesome that we don't need cable anymore. Yeah. Right. You know, we can kind of choose our content, choose our channels and everything right through right. these new systems right. that hook right into your awesome right. TV screens. So. Roku boxes, anybody have a Roku box? Yeah, very cool. Apple yeah, very TV, affordable same too. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, same thing. Uh, but yeah, any Blu-ray player, you can do it. And also game game consoles, too. We haven't talked a lot about games. Yeah. I could go talk about games, too, if you want me to. Uh, that's another time. session, I guess. Um, <laughs> no, with, with five minutes left, you don't want to get me started on that topic. I'll go for hours. <laughs> well, Chase and I could talk who, about games. Who do you think may disappear from the game? <laughs> okay, I was, Live being, I was being facetious before about the uh, <laughs> the cable companies thing, but I mean, I, I you don't want to really make that prediction, but don't boom me out of the room. We are seeing a lot of internal trouble with Apple right now. Right. They're going to be around. We're seeing a lot of internal trouble. Um, we're seeing we've seen trouble from AMD. Uh, if you talk more on the tech side, we've seen trouble before from Intel, but they they seem to be pulling through it. Netflix has a very tenuous revenue model. If they're not growing, right now they seem to be in this secondary honeymoon phase after a stagnant period, but that's because of international growth. If they're not growing their customer base, they're not making profit. Um, So we see problems with Netflix. We see problems with Apple. I don't think any of these are going away in the long run. Um, And the ones that you think that might, like, for instance, Microsoft having trouble getting adoption, they've come out and said, listen, we have a giant war chest. So does everybody else. Nobody's going anywhere. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And I think that attitude just is everywhere within the technology industry. And uh, we'll we'll have some unexpected closures, but not not too soon, I don't think. Well, in the music business, I think uh, I read something very interesting this week, and it was on my my full sale Facebook page for music uh, distribution. We were discussing it on there. Um, there's an article out there this week that was saying, you know, we might not see the PROs, you know, like ASCAP, BMI, um, CSAC, Sound Exchange, all of those companies in the near future. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, the, I've, I've heard that too. Because yeah. of the way we're distributing right. and the way that it's working now. I mean, right. you can go and sit in a restaurant and you can just click on your app and, and know what song is playing in there. So there, I know that they are, these companies are getting smaller and smaller. So what do you, what do you think, Susan? Yeah. Go ahead with that. <laughs> you know, I'm one of those people that likes to look at the glass being half full, not half empty. So I don't want to say who's not going to be around. Um, but I will tell you that um, uh, there are going to be some big changes as far as, uh, uh, and I'm not going to talk about technology, um, but who owns what? Um, I think the media conglomerates are going to get bigger. Yeah. They're going to keep acquiring companies. Somebody less of them. Yeah, so I mean, it's gonna. Like Disney. I I think that they're gonna probably figure out a way to. Uh, I think exclusivity is even gonna be more important with content. Mm-hmm. Is you make it because it, it's those a la carte things, right. and HBO's kind of got it nailed down as like more very exclusive. And if you want, so I think that's gonna be huge going forward still too, as exclusivity to make money on content, and um, I think that. Independents have a huge opportunity. I think all of you guys have a huge opportunity in the future. And if you know how to tell a good story, if you know how to make quality content, I think 
as my mom used to say, the world is your oyster. So go for it. I think that's the perfect way to wrap up the, uh, the panel discussion. I, I, I want to thank you guys for sharing all this information. Let's uh, give a round of applause for Susan, Chase, and Brandy. Thank you all.